you for, so much for coming to the first speaker series of the 2017-2018 Oxyard Speaker Series. Thanks so much for coming out. Um, we have a really fantastic um, lineup of speakers this year. There's a, oop, there's a list on the back of your handout for all sorts of things. Our upcoming speakers after, to, after tonight. On um, October 30th, we have Amita Smodabali, who's a visual artist and photographer based here in L.A. On uh, November 27th, we have Zachary Drucker, who's a writer, performer, visual artist, trans activist, and one of the producers of Transparent, the um, Amazon show. Uh, next semester, we have Anthony Ortega and the Quetzalcoatl Mural Project. And so they're a muralist collective that's based um, right here in our neighborhood. And then on February 26th, Justin Chan, who's a filmmaker and actor, and um, has a film out right now about the Korean and Korean American experience during the 92 riots. And you also might know him from the Twilight series. So he will be here also. Um, other events, we in our Wine Guard Gallery right now, we have Molly Alice, a child with the one that turned on the switch. A really cool game-based interactive exhibition. You can touch stuff, you can climb on stuff. There's robots. Um, highly recommend stopping in there. There's going to be puppet shows this weekend on Saturday in the gallery. Um, October 19th, we have another, we have an opening in our gallery called Chicana Photographers LA. It's showcasing the work of uh, five LA Chicana artists, and that's going to be co-produced with uh, Avenue 50 Studios that's here in Highland Park. Um, Kenyatta A.C. Hinkle, our wellness artist in residence, will be leading a workshop called Navigating Aintness, exploring the Contifican Archive. That will involve, um, it's a performative lecture and a workshop, and that'll be on October 25th. And all of this is free and open to the public. Um, the speaker series is generously funded by the Arts and Urban Experience Initiative, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation. So, um, you can sign up for our mailing. If you're students, you're already on it, sorry. Uh, if you're not students, you can <laughs> sign up over there. Um, follow us on social media. I think hashtag OxyArts or at OxyArts, what, whatever. But OxyArts is our media handle. If you want to take photos during this and post it, that's totally fine. Um, so, without further delay, so our first speaker, Will Power, is an award-winning playwright and performer. His work has been seen at Dallas Theater Center, New York Theater Workshop, where I saw a piece of his actually a hundred million years ago. Uh, Marin Theater Company, Roundhouse Theater, True Colors Theater, uh, Brooklyn Academy of Music, otherwise known as BAM. La Jolla Playhouse, Children's Theater Company, and here at Oxy a few years ago with his play, The Seventh. Um, he is a key member of critically acclaimed avant-garde music groups, Midnight Voices in Omar Sosa Sextet. Um, he was also a guest of the U.S. State Department on five separate occasions, traveling all over the world. Um, on these travels, he taught community workshops uh, in shanty towns, worked with poets and former regimes of the Soviet Union, and lectured at libraries, grammar schools, and colleges. He's pretty much a, a man about town and the world. And um, we're really excited to have him here today. And joining him in conversation will be Professor Laurel Mead. Thank you. I was eight years old. My mama, I was on the playground, across from the liquor store. My mama, it was me and Kevin and Ricky and little Frank Lee. My mama, then Kevin say, hey, let's play hide and go seek. My mama, okay, but wait, where can you hide in an open playground? My mama, I ducked under the slide, but then Kevin started to put me down. My mama, he say, you too fat to hide under that slide right there, mama. In fact, he so damn fat, he can't hide anywhere. So I said, well, that's why your mama, she cry, because her son's so ugly. You got a nose so big that you can smell the dump three miles away. My mama. And Kevin say, don't be talking about me, man. <laughs> I'm going to tell my mama on you. My mama. And I said, don't be talking about me, man. Shoot him. I'm going to tell my mama too. My mama. <laughs> Next thing I know, mama on the playground. My mama. And Kevin, mama there too. And they're staring each other down. <laughs> my mama. St. Lucille. I work too hard. <laughs> my mama. But I do it for my son because William is my heart. My mama. Kevin is my baby. 
And my son is not ugly. Mm -mm, no, no. Anybody talk about my son, they're going to have to deal with me. My mama. Well, I heard your son teased my son first. My mama. Oh, yeah, maybe last time. But this time, the last time was way worse. Mm -hmm, see, because last time, your boy, Vanessa's boy, and Dante's little girl, Flo, told my son he was ugly and black like the dots on a domino. Now, your son got the nerve to talk about somebody being ugly and black because I'd rather be ugly and black than to be ugly, piss-colored, and fat. My mama. Lucille, I don't want no trouble, okay? My mama, just tell your son to stay the hell out of my son's way. Mama, how can he? Your son walking around here as big as a house. Stop feeding him. Get him off that tit. Put down your blouse, my mama. Lucille, you leave my son alone. My mama, hey. Out the purse, mama pulls out a nickel chrome. My mama, a 38, she start waving it in the air. I'll kill you if you mess with my son. No, I don't care. My mama. All the kids start laughing and running. We all scared. My mama. Then my grandma yelled, child. Don't go there. My mama. Now I think back on that day. Now that I'm grown. My mama. She raised me and my brother and my other brother on her own. My mama. And she said well, she got to make sure we grow to be men, mama. But that day, two queens in the sandbox, bloody and all the kids saying, my mama, I love her, my mama, my mama. Right, thank you. Thank you. I want to give a little overview, a little overview. Thank, first of all, thank y'all so much for having me. It's great to be here back at Occidental College and, you know, seeing some old faces and meeting some new faces and just, it's progressing. So it's awesome. So thank y'all so much for that. Um, I'm going to be interviewed by this amazing practitioner, professor, genius here. But we thought maybe I'd give you a few minutes of a, a, just a brief overview of my work, it's a little bit about my artistry, a little bit about the community engagement, yeah? And then we'll do some questions and then we'll, we'll open it up. Um, is that okay? Okay. okay. So, uh, thinking about this and talking to Susan and trying to, trying to sum up some of the things that I've been into, I feel like my, my, my trajectory kind of falls into three periods. You know, the first period is me as an artist creating and performing and engaging the community community of which I'm from, yeah? So I'm from the Fillmore District in San Francisco in the Bay Area. So the first, like, when I was a kid to like 25 years old or something, we were basically creating stories through theater, through hip hop and music that were characters actually from the community or people are based on characters from the community and then presenting that to the community which I was from, you know? And it started first just in our neighborhood and then we started getting citywide and then Bay Area wide, yeah? And uh, my first uh, experience in theater, I joined this children's theater company. And um, because it was California, this wasn't your usual children's theater company. This was a, a science, uh, science fiction, Afrocentric, space age, political <laughs> children's theater company, you know? <laughs> and uh, as only California can do, you know what I mean? <laughs> and uh, it was, uh, I don't know if anyone's heard of the musician Sun Ra. He's like a great like jazz musician, um, creator. And so one of his dancers uh, left, was on tour with him, and basically he was really into like space is the place and this crazy like cosmology. And, um, and so she left his band after a while and came into our neighborhood and started to make these, these real like politically charged science fiction plays. And so that was my first experience, you know. And I never forget, I was 10 years old, and the first piece I was in was called The Day Black Folks Left Planet Earth. That was the, that's what it was, that's what it was. And it was dealing with all these issues, these social issues, but in this real creative way. And it was about these black people that was just like, I'm done, I'm tired, I'm tired of racism, I'm tired of, there isn't no, I'm about to be out of here. So we built a, we had a little song, rocket ship, rocket ship, you know? So we built this rocket ship and we were like, we're gonna leave all the, the oppression that we're feeling in this, on this earth, in this country, you know? Um, uh, but that, but, so that was, that was cool, but the issue was, is that when we left, we were leaving this oppression, but we were also taking our trauma with us, you know? So we was taking like our alcoholism, not all of us, but some of us, we were taking our, our issues, our, our self, you know, our self-oppression and all that with us. You know, and like one guy was like, I'm gonna take my wives and my side ladies, you know what I mean? So he was kind of like <laughs> taking all the trauma with him on the rocket ship. 
So we get on, this is my first play ever. We get on the rocket ship. <laughs> we get on the rocket ship and we go to Saturn, right? Again, this is all based on Sun Rock. The Sun Rock thing was like we're from Saturn and all this kind of stuff. So we, go, we get to Saturn and we land. But what we didn't realize is that there were already black people on Saturn. You know? And the black people on Saturn looked at us and was like, nah, 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 nah. <laughs> like, y'all can't come here because y'all got too many issues. It's like, y'all got to go to Dave. You got to go back to Earth, work out your issues. Then you can come be with us, the black Saturnians. <laughs> and that was it, you know? But it was interesting because it was, it was this piece that was real imaginative, imaginative and way out, of, out, of, out there and crazy and, and fantasy. But it dealt with real issues, again, of like alcohol, substance abuse, you know, black on black issues, racism, economic racism. And so we did it, but we did it in like a funny kind of way. It was a real community driven piece. And I remember, you know, we had to sell cupcakes on the weekends to pay for the costumes and like, you know, and I, I saw even at that age, people like our community coming to the show and they would see themselves reflected you know, in the show. And they would laugh and like get emotional and just like, oh, those kids are great and that kind of thing. And so that was my introduction to what theater could do. You know, I'd seen some plays before, but that was my real introduction of like, it can be a vehicle for change and for dialogue in the community, yeah? Um, and so from then I got into hip hop and we started doing like local shows. And again, you know, we were reflecting the environment around us. And at that time in the 1980s in my neighborhood, it was a real crazy time. You know, there was a lot of like, you know, crack cocaine, just a lot of drama in my family, and a lot of stuff. So hip hop and theater was our way to get it out. Like something could happen on a Friday, we'd write about it on a Wednesday, and then we would do it at the local town show the next week. You know, so it was almost like news. Like it was really having a dollar trying to work these things out, you know. Um, and then we just kept developing, and like in the early 90s, this kind of big artistic scene bursted out in um, the Bay Area. It was like kind of like the birth of like, you know, the backpack rappers and the, you know, the uh, neo soul and all that kind of stuff. And so there's a lot of, a lot of great things going on. And so really, that was that first period. It was really about expressing what was going on locally. Okay, can we put the first slide on? I talked a little bit about this earlier today. So the upper room, ah, the upper room. Okay, so there was this, there was this guy, his name was Rafiq Bilal. He was the father of one of my good friends, Muhammad, who was in a rap group with me, yeah? Um, and back then, we didn't know we could make a living at, at hip-hop, because all back then, all the famous rappers from East Coast, so we just did it as something to have fun. Well, he went to like a private, like mostly wealthy school, so we did go over there and do some like little shows for $2, you know, <laughs> just make a little money, so we did do that. But mostly it was really just something we would, we, would, we would do. As we got into our early 20s, we started to hit nightclubs, we started to perform, and it started to become a real thing in the Bay Area, you know? Um, and so my friend's father, he was a substance abuse counselor at... Uh, uh, the Haight-Ashbury Free Clinic, you know, which is a real legendary place of substance abuse for treatment, and then later at Glide Memorial Church. And so he thought, he was like, there are so many people, unfortunately, in the Bay Area that are, that are uh, in recovery from drug abuse and, and, and alcohol abuse. He's like, so surely they need a place to socialize, to party, to dance. And so he was like, this is a vision, he's like, I'm going to create a non-alcohol, alcohol-free, Smoke-free, like back then you could still smoke in nightclubs in, in uh, California. So like smoke-free, alcohol-free, drug-free nightclub. And so he had, got, he had this little bit of inheritance from his mother when she sold this land. And so he took that and instead of investing it maybe in uh, something else that might have been more wise, he put it in a nightclub, right? <laughs> and then he opened the doors and nobody came. Because uh, at that time, at least a lot of people that were in recovery would only go where NA or, or Alcoholics Anonymous sanctioned them to go. Yeah. So myself and Muhammad and Muhammad's little sister Aisha, we were like, well, we know a lot of DJs, we know a lot of artists. Why don't we just start doing parties and start doing spoken words, start doing stuff? And so we started doing these things, and it became a real hub, a real mecca of activity for artists at that time. You know, um, and it was the kind of place it was be bigger than what any of us. It was the kind of place you had to get to, had to get to. Like, I remember years later, I was talking to this guy. He was like, the upper room, man. I just had to get there on Saturday. I had to get there. He's like, I remember one time. We really wanted to go, and the BART stops running at midnight. And this was in San Francisco, and he was from Oakland. He was like, and it was, oh, it was like eight of us in one car. So me and my friend, we went into the trunk. And we, they closed the trunk. We drove across the Bay Bridge. These dudes were in the trunk. <laughs> Just like, can you imagine? It's like, this crazy, terrifying. But it was that kind of place. And it really was about artists expressing themselves, expressing their environment. Again, this was in the early 90s, a lot of trauma. So it was a way to kind of let that, that stuff out. And it was a very... It had a lot of light energy in the place, you know what I mean? 
Um, because there was no alcohol, there was no drugs, but that also attracts people who are trying to like heal. You know, so we also had a lot, like a lot of a lot of drama um, in 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 the club. But it was a really beautiful place. Okay, next slide. And also, not only was it a great place for local artists, but it was a place that artists of national stature, of similar minds, they when they were around, they would kind of come through and do a show. Or if they couldn't do a show because of contract limitations, they would do like a late night talk or that kind of thing. So we had like De La Soul would come in, The Last Poets. Uh, we, we show films like Daughters of the Dust, KRS, Kane, The Roots. One time I was there and Flea from Red Hot Chili Peppers was hanging out. I was like, oh shoot, it's Flea. You know what I mean? Just out. <laughs> so it was that kind of place. You know, it was an exciting energy. It was a, it was a bit of, of tension, a bit of danger, but it was also a place where new art forms could be created. You know what I mean? So like a lot of hip hop theater, at least on the West Coast, came out of there. I was very involved in that. Um, our, our version of Neo Soul or whatever, and a number of people that work in Hollywood, and a lot of people that are like activists now in the community, like, you know, they work for immigration rights, or, you know, that kind of stuff. They kind of came out of that, that place. It was a kind of, that was the kind of place. We'll go to three or four in the morning. Mm. So that was awesome. So that was kind of the first, that first era for me, before, about 14, 15 years, you know, where I was like a local artist in the Bay, you know, expressing myself, expressing the environment around me. And the, our, my groups were bigger, they tend to be these big ensembles, you know. And that was that. And then the second phase, I would say, is like this phase where I became like a, 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 a traveling uh, artistic diplomat or like, you know, a, 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 a diplomat cultural engager or something like that, so, whatever. So I would basically, I would tour and I started to develop these solo shows that were very mobile that could tour. And so instead of being in the community where I was from and engaging, I start to tour and be invited as a, as a guest to perform and then do residency components, you know, with various communities around that theater, around that performing arts center. Um, and so I did that for about 12, 12, 13 years. And I would say like about, I was on the road like maybe six months out of the year, you know, on average. Sometimes it was four months, sometimes it was seven, you know. So I, I was able to like ex have just hundreds and hundreds of performers and just like, countless residency activities, anything from being in the town for two days to a sit down for six weeks, working with, you know, pr uh, teenage mothers, um, to working with, you know, immigrant rights, to homeless populations, to so-called disadvantaged communities, just a lot of different communities. And my thing was to, to listen, to like, what is needed, how can I help with that, you know? And so they took various forms. Sometimes it was about, okay, we're going to develop a piece. You guys have an issue right here with gentrification. We're going to develop a piece about gentrification. I'm going to give you some tools of performance, and then you're going to perform that piece on a Thursday, and my show's on a Friday, you know? Other times it was about, like, okay, we got these artists, and they're good, but they, they don't know how to perform. So can you help these hip-hop artists perform better? It, just, it, it varied a lot. So, but what this allowed me to do is not only to, like, contribute what little I could, but to learn about so many different communities and to learn and see how art can be utilized as a catalyst for change in a variety of different settings. I mean, I was in all kinds of places. Prestigious halls, Sydney Opera Festival, barns in Germany, shanty towns and stuff. I mean, I was just like, it was like a world, you know. And these shows I did were very, like I said, they were compact. I would have my, my, uh, my, my, cost, my suitcase of costumes, and we send the, you know, we send the light plot ahead. And we would just do it, you know? And I had a show called The Gathering, and then I had another show called Flow that was actually a duet. It was me and DJ Reborn, who I want to talk, to, I'll talk about in a second. But it was real mobile. And when we got, when we got real rich, we had a, a third tech person. <laughs> we were high on the hog then. But usually it was just two of us, and when I was doing The Gathering, it was just me. Like, I would just go, you know, and Tampa and a whole bunch of kind of places. So, okay, let's go to the, let's go to the next slide. So here's some of like some of uh, 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 the picture's not the best quality, but here's some of the things. This is me working with uh, a group in Tanzania, and it was a two-week residency. And again, and my thing was like, okay, how can I use theater as a way to do that? And also, I want this to slip in. How can they express themselves, their community? So this is a piece they're doing about, and the, the piece that we developed together was called Life on the Dollar Dollar. Dollar Dollar is like a bus, and that's him driving the, the Dollar Dollar. And but the Dollar Dollar is like it's not like a big roomy bus. It's like a you know, small bus, and you know, people get on there, like bring the animals on, you can barter with it. It's a real lively bus. So it's like all these characters on the bus and how they do it. And we brought in issues, like there was one character that was a European, and you know, it was, was kind of like, you know, people want her to give money, she didn't want to, so she felt exploited, but she was also exploiting them. And so we kind of brought that out in the piece. Okay, next slide. So that was Tanzania. These are a couple of the ones in Africa. This was in, uh, in South Africa. My man's looking at me like I'm crazy, like, what? But um, so this was, this was a group of artists in Pretoria that I was mentoring. And basically, 
they were, they were great, these, these were hip-hop artists, the other ones were more theater, but they were great artists on a record, but they didn't know how to really perform live, which is sometimes the case with hip-hop artists, you know, for some. And so, we were basically working on putting together a live show, and what I was trying to impress upon them is the same precision, the same meticulousness that you put on your recordings, you have to put that same meticulousness on your live show, because the, the recordings were like, fleshed out and thorough and they, you know, but the live show was just like, yo, 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 yo. And I was like, no, no, no. What is the journey of the live show? So at first they were kind of looking at me like, oh man, you know, what, what is this? But by the end they were like, we really, and these were like some of the more popular, these were like professional artists in that area. You know, younger than me, but professional artists. But by the end they were like, we see what you mean now. Because we kind of constructed, it wasn't theater, but we constructed an art, a journey. Like, what do you, you know, how do you take the audience low? How do you take them high? What are you trying to do? You know? Okay, next slide. So that's, that's them. This is in, this is in Cape Town. We were working there, and it's funny because there I'd be like not African American, I'd be colored, you know what I mean, I guess, you know what I mean, they have that, that kind of thing. So they, they look black to me, but they were like, no, we're colored, so it's kind of <laughs> a different kind of thing. Okay, next slide. And that's an old, that's a, I had to just wear braids back then, that's an old uh, <laughs> picture of me doing, doing the bow and arrow with flow. And um, I don't know whether, I guess the art, we can talk about this later, I don't know if the art came first or the, the community engagement, but oftentimes, the kind of, the nature of the community engagement I was doing would, would be in tandem with the art. You know what I mean? So in this phase of my life, I was doing these solo shows that were really mobile, and so I was traveling around a lot. In the first stage, I was doing like bigger shows, like ensembles that were local, based in the community where, where I grew up. So it just depended. Okay, next slide. Ah, okay, this is DJ Reborn. She's the baddest DJ on the planet. She's the baddest mm -hmm. DJ. And that was deep because she's also a phenomenal teacher. So when we would tour together, you know, a lot, first of all, back, it's better now, back then, a lot of people would be like, I've never even seen a female DJ, they're like, I don't, you know, and she's like, you know, of course she is, she's a female DJ, is also like, you know, like, she's bad, you know what I mean, like, this. she's not like, you know, for show, you know what I mean, so like, she's like, killing, and there was also def def definitely some, some theaters, you know, you know, so she dealt with some misogyny, like, some of the tech people, not that, I mean, tech people are great, but you know, like, some places, like, you know, let me help this one, let me help you with that, honey, you know, that kind of stuff, she's like, she's like I'm from Brooklyn, back up, you know, but, um, but I would see the effect. So we would, you know, when we first started the to tour, you know, I knew her talent as a, sh a performer, but I didn't realize how great she was as a teacher. So when I saw her mentoring students, I'm like, oh, we're gonna be great. So we would do a lot of stuff together. And she, I, I tell you, the young women, like the way that their faces would light up to see her, and she would, she does, she does like, she would do empowering things. And so like, let's say there was a, a song that that um, some of the women uh, that she was working at loved, but it was a real misogynistic song. She was like, look, let's take those lyrics off keep the music, and let's recreate lyrics and keep the music. So you can empower yourself to flip the record, you know? And it's something that's so simple, but a lot of people didn't think that, yeah, I can keep, because really I like this beat, I don't like these, 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 these violent lyrics. But so she, would, so she would help them write these new lyrics to the music that they like, so they don't have to be like, you know, saying stuff that they agree themselves, you know, that kind of thing. So she's a real, real special, but we, we traveled for many years together. Okay, next slide. Okay, okay, so... <clears throat> This is the thing with the State Department. So I got involved with the State Department, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later, but this is basically like uh, Turkmenistan, you know? And Turkmenistan is like one of the most oppressive dictatorships. It's like North Korea and Turkmenistan. <laughs> so it's, it's kind of it's crazy, you know? So every place is different. So here, my, my goal was to make them feel like they could express themselves, but it's difficult because if you express yourself in the wrong way, you could like be snatched up, you know what I mean? So I had to figure out like how to like help them express themselves and feel like they have the power to do that and feel okay, but like be kind of cool about how you do it, you know? And the other thing is there, just clapping your hands is a radical notion because there, if like, you know, if you and I are talking, it's cool, and but four more people come, the police break it up. Unless you're like in a market or something, like six people can't like gather on the street. So when I started this, this was a concert, and I did this concert, they were just like, and then finally I opened them up, and, and you know, just them clapping was like, just, it's something simple for us, like clapping hands. They were like, oh, then they went crazy, I'm like, oh, what's going on here? Because they just, you know, stuff that we take for granted, even though we have a lot of problems here, stuff we take for granted. Um, okay, next slide. So we did that, and then like, this is one example, like, you know, we were going out to these different schools, and, you know, speaking and doing workshops, and they, they, were, they, they were dressed in the traditional garments, and they, they bring, like, treats, and it was just a real awesome exchange, you know. But again, every place is different. So Kyrgyzstan, 
very different than Turkmenistan. They both stand, but very different. So you out, where are you? What do you, what what is needed? And then then I then I, I would work the program. I would develop content, but I had to like really listen to what was happening. And it was I don't know if it was this school or another one. It was really crazy. So you know we having a uh, question answer period after I, I spoke and we did some some uh, interactive stuff. And they were like, do you like Turkmenistan? I was like, yeah, I love it. I was like, the people are really, really beautiful. And I really mean that. They were like beautiful people. And I was like, it's really different over here. And they were like, well, how? And it was a small classroom just like this. And a parent, few parents came, see me in the back. And they were like, well, how is it different? I was like, well, in the United States, when you're on an airplane, there's television everywhere, which is so United States, a better word. Like everyone's just plugged into TV. Like you ever been on t uh, uh, a plane and the TV's not working, people get really angry, like, ah. <laughs> and I was like, I need my TV, right? But I was like, on the plane from Turkey to Turkmenistan, I was like, there's no television, it's just a pic picture of the president everywhere on the plane. Like, president there, president, I went to the bathroom, there's president. <laughs> it's crazy. And so I started laughing. I did not intend to make fun of them. It was just such an gr um, amazing contrast between like all these televisions and then like all these images of the president. I started laughing. And then it got a little tense. And then we went on, and we, it, was, it was cool. We were talking, and then we were leaving. And someone from the embassy in the car was like, "Listen, great, great job." And like, I know you didn't mean anything, but you have to be careful when you were laughing about the president. You know, I know you didn't mean to offend, but it could be misunderstood. Their English is not, you know, like, and it, it could be misunderstood as you insulting the president. They were like, "And you'd be okay, but the teacher would disappear." So I was like, "All right." No joking, no, no laughing with the president, you know what I mean? So it was just really different. So again, it depends on where you are and what you're doing and how you engage. It's a little tricky. Okay, I want to play this video of Turkmenistan too, and I want to talk a little bit about, about it, and then I'll, I'll move on. Black History Month celebration in Turkmenistan closed with a jazz and blues concert at the Turkmenistan Theater in Ashgabat. In the theater lobby, the embassy set up an information booth that had a variety of publications about the United States and African American history. The U.S. Chargé d'Affaires in Turkmenistan, Aline Malloy, opened the concert and welcomed the others. The struggles and successes of Americans, African Americans, and to learn more about their incredible journey from slavery right through the hard-fought battles of, uh, for civil rights in the United States until today's positions of full equality, respect, and leadership. Musicians and singers from the American community here in Turkmenistan perform. Turkmenistan. People were jumping up and down in their seats. Over 
on stage. We even had trickling break dances, which I didn't even know existed. It was spectacular. What a great show. Thanks. All right, cool. So I want to show that for a couple of reasons. One is when you're looking at community engagement and you're partnering with another organization, you have to figure out what their purpose and what their mission is may not be exactly what your purpose and mission is. Joel Rush, look at you. But is there enough overlap there? Right? Is there enough overlap to you to, you to do something? So, for example, um, the State Department's mission is to spread democracy slash capitalism, right? I'm just being honest, right? And to open up trade to make the money, right? I mean, I'm just being honest. My goal is to try to help empower communities, or better yet, give them the tools to empower themselves, right? Through art and creative expression to build stronger communities. So, those are not the same objectives. But there was, I felt there was enough overlap there, you know, to make it to make it work. So if every time you're working in a community, you have to figure out is there enough there for, for us to make this work or not. In this case, I felt like it was, but it was a little different. Like the um, the ambassador, like I didn't, you know, that wasn't my thing of like <coughs> African Americans from slavery to some rights to full citizenship, <laughs> full respect. I was like, yeah, wouldn't they say, say it that way? <laughs> you know. But you know, and so sometimes you might, as an artist, you might have to be like, you know. You know, from the get-go, this is not enough here for me to really you know, have a, a relationship, you know. But with this, they never censored me or anything, and everyone was different. This, this particular program was like a concert, which I never get to sing, sing songs like that here. So it was great. And then we did, you know, other stuff. Other times it's about developing original theater, working with hip-hop artists or dancers or theater. So it just depends on what is, what is needed. So anyway, that's the second phase. And then the third phase, I would say, is around the time I started having children, it started to be about less... Uh, traveling and more staying in one locale, you know, um, and building community there and also writing plays that would go out. So that started about 10 or 12 years ago too. So instead of me performing, I'd write a play and hopefully it would cast some energy and it would go out and people would build community things and, and dialogue around the play, you know. And partly that's because I was, uh, I, was, I was a parent and also, again, when you're traveling around, it's like you can do like two weeks here, three weeks there, and that's good, but the real work sometimes, or a different kind of work, is when you're in a place for a year, or two years, or three years. And so this has culminated in like me being able to write a lot of plays, a lot of musicals that have been able to go out and do stuff, and also in the last five or six years being in Dallas, you know, and working in Dallas. And we can talk a little bit more about, about what that is, but uh, I, I think that's about it. Let me see. This is, this is one of those plays when I find to start to sit down and think. This is the seven. This is not the one in uh, Occidental, but this is the one in uh, New York Theater Workshop. And it was, a, like she said, an adaptation of a Greek piece. It was kind of like the precursor to, to Hamilton in a way. I mean, it was all verse, and you know what I mean? It was kind of the first time that really happened. And um, it was great. And this is a, a, a very young um, um, Uzo Aduba from Orange is the New Black. You know, she was kind of coming up. And that's also been kind of a joy. There's been a few, like, youngsters that have come through the play and, and like, they're doing what? You know, like the guy playing Cyborg, you know, he was like Muhammad Ali. I'm like, man, you're Cyborg now. You're like, you know, we're from Superhero Ali to Superhero Cyborg. You know? <laughs> okay, next slide. This is a piece I did a couple of years ago uh, with uh, Ann Bogart, the amazing Ann Bogart, um, the City Company, yeah? And it was called Steel Hammer. She grabbed four playwrights to reimagine John, the legend of John Henry. So it was her acting company, four different playwrights. I was one of them. And um, her name is Julie Wolf, an amazing composer who just won the Pulitzer, actually. And again, that was great because we created it together um, with, with Anne's style, with City Company style, and with our text, and with this with Julie Wolf's music. And then we did it at Humana Festival. We did it here in L.A. too at uh, UCLA Live. Uh, I think Royce Hall. Royce Hall, yeah. Um, but I wasn't there for this. I was at Humana, and then it went on. Went on to BAM. Then they did it like in Abu Dhabi. You know what I mean? So again, it's kind of like it's not the same as you going, but it's a different kind of thing. Your words still go. So I was like, wow. My words were in Abu Dhabi. Yeah. I've never been there, but the words were there. Okay, next slide. And of course, you know, writing plays is another way to get out there. It's my play, Fetch Clayton, man. Okay, that's it. I've talked enough. I mean, I haven't talked enough, but that opened okay. <laughs> So we're going to, I'm going to, I've got a couple questions, i got a yeah. million questions oh. actually, but I'm going to try to pare them down, and then we'll open up to questions from you. Thank you again yeah, for all of that. You. So great to see you perform and talk about your work and hear about the various sort of things that you do. So I had some questions prepped, but just hearing you, I, I, uh, I want to start with, you said, I talking about your work in Turkmenistan, mm -hmm. you said I opened them up, and I think 
on the video, we get some evidence, perhaps, of how you open them up, right? Just with your presence and your performance. But I'm curious if you would give us some other insights and wisdoms about how you open them up, and or when you're working with a group, um, like that classroom situation where you showed mm -hmm. us the photo of, you said where, that you asked them where are you and what is needed. Can you give us some specifics about how you actually ask those questions mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. receive information? <coughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And just how, how like, I just want to, I would love details about how a specific project unfolds. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's great. So the, f the, the first one is basically, I wouldn't say I open them up, but it's, it's basically about, like, as a performer, no matter what the genre is, dance or theater or music, giving the audience permission to relax, to participate. That seems like the obvious thing, but a lot of times we don't, or maybe we make it about us. So for me, it's always about like opening up and giving the audience permission. So really it was about, and I don't have to give them any more permission, but they, a place like Turkmenistan, they feel like they needed permission. You know what I mean? Or else they probably would have, I mean, I don't know what they would have done. They might have just sat there and like listened. Just, you know, and I was like, yeah, it's all right, come on. You know, and then like, you know, and then, then it's like, then it's like you can't put the lid on. You know, so a lot of times it's like, it's how you, if you can be gracious as a performer, to like share. I've seen certain performances, I remember this one uh, flamenco dancer, not to disrespect, but he was so amazing, but it was about him, you know, like he was a great dancer, he was very attractive, he had the long hair, I mean, dude was fine, you know what I mean? <laughs> and he, you know, he was, a, but it was very like, I'm not going to try to, you know, but it was very like, you know, like you turn, he was just like, yes, I'm beautiful, I was, and I was like, yeah, you are beautiful, <laughs> but it wasn't like, it wasn't an opening up to like, we are beautiful, does it make any sense? Yeah. You know, so like, I, so it was still interesting, but after a while, it's like, so I, it's like, how do you open that up, you know? And again, part of it is also experience, like, like you mentioned a couple of those groups, I, like Omar Sosa Sextet was an Afro-Cuban, he's an Afro-Cuban piano player, so I was in that group for a number of years. And that wasn't really a lot of community residency components, it was like performing. And so night after night, we hit like, like through France, Germany, the United States, and so it's like, and his, but his energy, he's a, he's a Santero, his energy is very open and very like, like, you know what I mean? So, like, I would feed off that and just open the audience. Again, when people think of jazz, now they think of very, like, even though it didn't start that way. So, we said, like, it can, you can enjoy. So, I was used to kind of, like, bringing kids up on stage and just opening that up. So, that's, that's that part. As far as the second question you asked, you know, um, with the State Department work and even other stuff. Someone calls from Iowa. We want you to come and do your show for two nights and do a week of residency. You know, what's that about? It's really, particularly if you've never been there, which might oftentimes be the case, then it's really, you have to have a real detailed conversation with the presenter that you're speaking with. And you have to trust him or her. And they may not know what they're talking about, but you have to trust that they know their community. You know what I mean? Or they know what purpose. Like if Dina's going to call, like we did now, you call me and say, this is what I want to do. And so then I can suggest things. So a lot of times I'd get a call and say, hey, we have this situation in the country or this city or whatever. And we would love you to do, we would love to engage our community. And this is what our need is. And then I would say, oh, wow, okay, well, what about this? Or what about this? And we would kind of bounce ideas off each other and collectively between me and that representative kind of work those things out. But it's tricky because oftentimes I'm not necessarily talking to the people that I'm going to be working with. I mean, it may be a representative from that, but it may not. Sometimes you might get there and find a totally different thing than what you knew, and then you just have to improvise mm -hmm. and figure it out, you know? So it just depends on what is the need of the community. And I try my best to listen. And a lot of times before I have that initial conversation with them, I try to do some research and just try to figure it out. Obviously, if it's a place that I've done work before, then that's different. And there's been a number of places where I've returned, and that's really nice because you can kind of build on it, you know. Like, you know, there's a place in Iowa. I don't know why, but I just I went there a number of times. And we just built it up in Iowa, you know what I mean? Like, it was just like, Iowa, you know? It's just cool. You never know. Yeah. That's the other thing that's great about that, that phase of my life of traveling a lot is that you know, as a performer, you get to go to places that you may not go to for a vacation. Not to diss, but you know, you probably wouldn't go to, I mean, Iowa is great, or Indianapolis, but you probably wouldn't go to those, or Dallas, you wouldn't go to those places for a vacation. But you get to see these, these communities, you know what I mean, experience this stuff. So, yeah, it's been great. Um, all right, I'm going to, huh, let's go to this. Jump in. Vis-a-vis -vis your, your president story about Turkmenistan and the images mm -hmm. of the president there. I was looking at your blog, mm -hmm. and to quote you from a blog post from February of this year, mm -hmm. nothing like an evil president and dire world situations to crank up creativity, <laughs> sending it into overdrive, these are your words, right. Well, right? Nothing like an evil president and dire world situations to crank up creativity. So, here we are. Like, can you just talk to us about... Perhaps your practice now versus a year ago. Yeah, well, you know, it's, it's interesting. Like, like, in some ways it's kind of messed up, but I kind of feel like 
like I didn't talk about this a lot, but I came from, I came from a real like you know activist roots. You know, my parents like my, my father was in SNCC and like he was on the Pettus Bridge. Like he was one of the people who got beat up like during like the movie Selma and like. You know, my mother was a communist, and they were in, so we had that around the family, you know, my cousins in the Black Panthers. So I grew up with that, so I guess there's it's always been a part of that social justice push coming from the Bay Area, you know. We don't, our generation doesn't wear it the same way, I don't have like the black leather glove or whatever, you know, but it's about like, what can you do? And I guess, I was still creative during the Obama administration, but there's something about, for me personally, when Trump came into his presidency, he was like, okay, what am I really doing? And, and not stressing, but like, what do I really want to do? How can I make every second count? And it just kind of really focused me, you know? Like, it really focused me in a way that I hadn't been focused before. It's kind of unfortunate, you know? But I, I think sometimes in chaotic times, the artists are, artists are always needed, but in these kind of times, they're really needed to rise up, you know, and, and to say something, you know, and to do something, yeah? Um, so that's the thing. But now, again... Well, if you travel to a place like Turkmenistan, I'm not going to go there and jeopardize the people and be like, this is the, you know, dictator. I'm trying to kind of do it in like a, not subversive, but kind of like, kind of like this. You know what I mean? Um, for me, but also like, I'm probably going to be all right, but for the people there, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it's crazy. I'm, you know, I'm Will. I'm not like, you know, some world famous dude, but like, they, you know, that's the only concert they get there every year. They have their traditional music and that. That's it. That's it. That's crazy. So I'm like, okay, for these people, this is important. You know, um, but yeah, I don't know how everyone else feels, but that's kind of how I feel. You know, yeah. Can you talk a bit about permission? You talked about instilling the idea of permission in the people that you're working with, and one of the things I've always recognized in your work is that you seem to, perhaps this is just my sense of it, give yourself permission to express and to deeply do your thing. And I will say, I'm going to talk to you like there's no people listening right now, <laughs> that sometimes I encounter in some of our students a fear about audacity mm -hmm. and a fear about really letting go and saying, maybe dealing with danger, saying something that they're fearful of, they're worried it's going to get them in trouble or what mm -hmm. have you. And one of the things I've recognized in your work and that I admire so much about it is that you seem to give yourself permission. Mm -hmm. Do you sense that in your own work? Is it something that you tangle with? And I wonder what words of wisdom you have to us, for us about yeah. giving oh. yourself permission. I mean, if you don't say it, who's going to say it? You know what I mean? Now, I'm not saying that you need to say something in a situation that could, could do you physical harm or something like that. I'm not saying that. you got to be safe. But at the same time, if you don't say it, who's going to say it? Like, what's the, what's, what's the brother's name, the football player that first took the knee? Kaepernick. Yeah, Kaepernick. So he took the knee. I think he's still out of a job, which is D. Yes. You know what I mean? So that was really brave. He probably lost millions of dollars. Again, I'm not, don't tell your parents that Will said lose millions. I'm, I'm not saying that. I'm just saying, like, he, obviously it was something that was really in him to, to do this. Maybe he was wrestling with it. I don't know. Maybe not. But he took a knee. And now, because of circumstances beyond him, other people are taking a knee. And it's becoming this national trend of all these athletes really standing up. And athletes have a lot of power. You know what I mean? So I don't, I don't, I don't know. It's never been something that, that I didn't think to do. I guess it's just, you know, it's growing up. It's like you got to express yourself and say what you need to, what you need to say, you know. I think it's really key to, to be clear on what you're trying to do. There's definitely been times, like, if I'm working with my director or something like that, and they're like, this is having this intention. This, this is having this reaction. I'm like, oh, that's not what I mean. You know what I mean? So it's good to make bold things, but if, you, if it's something that's happening that you don't want it to do, then you shouldn't do that. You know what I mean? So you have to be clear on what, what that is. But I, I don't know. No, yeah. It's kind of a hard question, Anne. I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's, it's a tough one. It's, I think it's one. I, it's one I, I know no. our students wrestle with, and I sort of wish we wrestled with it a bit more about confronting danger in your in your work, or perhaps the effect it. Yeah. You know, I don't know. That's an interesting question. I mean, I think I think that it is dangerous. I mean. You know, it's a it's a bold risk to be an artist, and I think. But listen, it not to be depressing, but it used to be like 30 years ago that maybe there were some other more stable careers, and I guess that's still the case to an extent, but less so now, right? It's not like you can get the company job and coast for 60 years. It ain't even like that no more. So you might as well do what you love, and and you know what I mean, and find a career out of it. Like I, you know, I've made a living as an artist for many years. Some some years were leaner than others, you know. But I was always, you know, I, but I was doing what I was supposed to be doing, you know. I don't believe in, I, this again, it's probably going to up to the parents, whatever. But I don't believe in like a fault, something to fall back on, you know. 
I just don't believe in that. I don't believe in that. That's not to say that if you have dual interests, you should pursue both of them. If you want to be a computer scientist and you want to be a dancer, pursue. But if you're like, I want to be a dancer, you know, but I'm going to be an accountant just in case that fails, just to have something to fall back on. Well, you're already setting yourself up for failure by putting that energy out there. You know, do what you love to do. And it'll come up. Maybe you'll be a dancer. Maybe you'll become a choreographer. Maybe you'll be a dance administrator. But, you know, who knows how it's going to come out. But pursue what you love that needs. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of your work now, would you talk to us about what you're doing at SMU and the special position that you hold yeah, there? Yeah. So, talk so, that so that's that's kind of uh, this 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 third kind of you know period era. That, you know, thinking about it. So basically, at SMU, I'm on the faculty. My title is artist in residence. So I'm not a tenure track, but I'm on the faculty. And my job there is to kind of like bring some of the outside in. You know, because um, a lot of the, the faculty are great teachers, but they, a lot of them, they don't have as much practical experience. They have more academic experience. I have less academic experience, more a lot of practical experience. So they want to have a blend of that between the academic teachers and the, the practitioners. You know, and it's not always a cut and dry thing, but you know. So they brought me in, and so I do teach some courses, but a lot of what I do is like directed study. So like if someone wants to write a play or do a solo piece, they can work with me one on one like every week and we can develop it or if you have a small group. So it gives you like more intimate studies that kind of can hopefully complement and add to what you're learning in your core courses. And then I do projects. So for example, I got this piece I'm doing next year at La Jolla Playhouse and we're going to bring the director, uh, Jaime Castaneda, there for a couple of days to workshop the piece with students. You know what I mean? So it's going to help them, it's going to help us. And so they get like that kind of energy. So it's kind of bringing the, the, that part of it in and kind of being on hand. So it's, it's that part. Um, and then I got this, uh, it's really good, I got this Mellon residency. Good old Mellon. They funded a lot. I love Mellon. What would we do without Mellon? You know, that's not... Anyway, so I'm also the playwright in residence at Dallas Theater Center. And that's a, that's a flagship theater in Dallas. It's kind of like the equivalent of, you know, Center Theater Group, uh, Mark Tabor Forum, or Pasadena Player, kind of like the flagship. And so what I do there is... You know, they produce my plays once every few years, they put on a play once every couple of years, but also I'm on staff, so I'm working on diversity policy, I was mentoring playwrights outside of the university, because a lot of playwrights aren't in school, but they, you know, they're good, but they don't have a lot of uh, access to opportunity, particularly down there. So I started like a playwriting program at Dallas Theater Center, and just, you know, the diversity thing, that's, I mean, ethnic diversity and also gender diver you know, diversity, it's kind of like two steps up, one and a half steps back, you know, it's just kind of a process, you know. <laughs> But so I'm, so I'm doing that there. So that's my, my charge there. And then I got this opportunity there to, to live on campus. I got a lot of residences. I'm a faculty in residence. So I live in, it's a dorm. They call it commons, but it's like a, it's like a dorm. It's a dorm. I live in a faculty apartment. You guys have those here. I don't know if it's a different. We don't. No? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so it's really, it's, really, it's really cool. So some kind of, I don't know what the studies, I don't know what studies, but some studies show that if there's a faculty apartment in the dorm and students see that faculty member with family on a regular basis, it's healthier for the students, you know what I mean? So I live with my family in a really nice faculty apartment that's connected to the, the building. And so we don't teach courses, we do events. So we'll do like smoothie Sundays, or we'll do a trip to the museum. And it kind of, you know, and just, you know, they love playing with the dog. They say, you know, they, they are ch my children are like, they're like little brothers and sisters now. And so it's kind of like helps give like a more supportive, holistic environment. You know, so with that part, that's been interesting because I, you know, again, I didn't come up in academia, but now it's like I'm talking to the provost. I'm, I'm in student life, and you know, if something goes on, like somebody gets, you know, there's a fight or something like that, I'm involved in that. Like I don't, I don't deal with like if someone vomits or like you know, <laughs> you know calling the police. We have a residential commons director, but it's like the, the charge is like the intellectual leadership of the building. Mm -hmm. That's how they put it to, to me. So how do you lead intellectually? And so that's been great because prior to that I was working exclusively in the theater department, which is awesome. And I was telling the, the last uh, the class, it's like, you know, the theater department is really good. It's, it, you know, art tends to be more progressive, more, you know, more inclusive. I'm not saying we're all there yet, but more. Yeah. But, but, but now I'm able to try to have an impact with, you know, the business majors. So, like, you know, Dallas is a, it's not a big art culture city, but it's huge for business. And so I'm like, wow, these are going to be the leaders of tomorrow. These are going to be the people who are going to be running. There's a lot of companies in Dallas, like you know, Pizza Hut, and, you know, 7-Eleven, AT&T. I mean, it's, it's a, you know, because they, you know, they give tax breaks. It's kind of messed up. That's a whole other thing. But so I'm like, I got, so I'm mentoring the leaders, so maybe I can put a little something in them, you know. And it's deep, like stuff we take for granted. Like this is a very, I'm not saying it's, you know, I'm not saying it's like, you know, it probably could be more diverse here, but it's pretty diverse, you know, compared to a lot of places. You know, there it's like, it's starting to happen, but some people are like, hey, 
you're the first black and Latino teacher I've ever had. Like in life, like, you know, I just have someone to cut my grass, that's it, it's crazy. So they miss out too, you know what I mean? Um, so it's just kind of, that's what I do there, just having that presence, you know. But that's kind of what I'm saying, like right now in my, my life, it's like to live in one city and to try to have an impact citywide. I still do some traveling, mm -hmm. you know, but less of it because I'm more interested now in like how do you develop for a number of years, you know what I mean? It's a different kind of work. When you're popping in for two weeks at a time or a month or two days, that's important. But really you're there to support the people that are here, you know. And so it's like, okay, how can I get people energized, give some tools, and now I'm out to Cleveland, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's important, but I'm not, I'm not, I won't say it's not real work, but it's also like the people that are there doing the work. But that takes time. You can't really, like, fake that. Does it make any sense? Not that you can fake the, 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 the traveling, but you have to know people, you know. And it's starting to happen in Dallas now, which is cool. Like, you know, I might go to the grocery store and I see the teacher of my, my daughter or, you know, someone I mentor and I see their cousin who knows, you know, that kind of thing. But those things take, like where you're from, it takes years to kind of build that up, you know. Does that answer your question? Kind of, yeah. I'm I really, <laughs> the faculty member in me who's never lived with students is, I'm like, what's that really like? Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I won't go into detail, but it's really cool. I mean, the way the apartment is, is structured is there's two entrances. And I don't know if it's interesting, interesting to you guys, but it's like one goes to the outside and one goes into the dorm. You know what I mean? So it's part of the building, but it's on the side. And so we'll have an event like, you know, like, like oh, like this, like this week coming up, there's a, we have a faculty affiliate. So there's... I'm a faculty in residence. We have a couple of faculty members that are affiliated with the, with the dorm that do like smaller bits of programming. So he does a lot of stuff with homeless populations. And so he's going to bring someone who was in an independent film that he did that used to be homeless but is, but is not homeless anymore. He's going to come speak to us in my apartment. You know, because a lot of times, particularly in Dallas, I guess L.A. is like this too, but like in the driving culture. Like in San Francisco where I grew up, you have more opportunity to talk to a homeless person. Just, you know, but when you're in your car, it's just like, eh, you know, you just don't, you just have the opportunity. So like we're going to do that kind of thing. So it's really cool. I mean, there's a classroom that's close. So during finals, they get a little loud. And we got to do mom and papa, like turn it down, you know. But usually <laughs> we, don't, we don't really hear them, you know. You know, I mean, there's a couple of times people can knock on the door. Can I come in? I left my key, you know, that kind of thing. But it's really cool, and it's been really great for my children. I mean, this is kind of a side point, but just like, I, that's, I want them to, to, to be able to have ownership of the college experience before they get to college. And I'm hoping they're 10, they're twins, you know. And so when they, when they first got there, they didn't understand. Like we did our, the first year we did a smoothie Sunday. Someone, we put a sign outside, someone stole the sign. You know what I mean? And my daughter did it. She's like, why did they steal the sign? <laughs> but now she's like, hey, college kids, you know what I mean? <laughs> You know, but I had to, but I had to explain to her. I was like, "Look, everyone here is really beautiful, but everyone's coming with different sets of experiences. You know, some people are more mature than others. You know, some people are like very mature. Some people are gonna steal your signs. So they stole this sign, and then they they returned it like five months later. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, and my daughter was like, "There's the sign. It's like, it's way in the spring." It was like, <laughs> but I was like, you know, so I was hoping that those experiences, my daughter and my son, they'll have those experiences. So when they get to college, they'll they'll feel a sense of ownership. I'm like, oh, I know this. I know this. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, if I have a couple more questions, are we? we We're oh, it's, cool. it's We've got, we, we, Can I ask one last, yes, and then we'll absolutely. turn it over? All right. <laughs> this is a bit of a dangerous question yeah. on my part because I bring this up occasionally in class, and sometimes students look at me a little funny. What is the role of love in your work? Oh man, that's deep. The role of love. <laughs> Theater, part of, uh, part of the root of theater for me is empathy, you know? And so I think the love comes in with trying to see the love and the humanness in all characters, i.e. all people. Times like this with the Trump presidency is really hard. It's really hard, you know? It's easier for me if there's someone who's like on a local level who's sexist or homophobic or racist and they're like, you know, uh, and, you know, I can still see the, the, the true deep human under there. But, like, someone like this is really hard. But I think the love thing is to still actively fight against what you don't like, but somehow try to still see the humanity in the people. You know what I mean? And that's where the love is. And your characters, particularly if you're constructing original characters, they need that. Like, there's not. Well, let me, let me back up. There is a place for kind of political agitprop theater, like the Mind Troop or something like that. There is a place where, like, the evil guys are real evil, the good guys. There is a place for that. You know what I mean? Like, kind of like that. But I think most theater, for me, that's really provocative are those ones where 
you know, really good stories where the, 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 the antagonist or whoever is really evil, but you see, the, you see why they're like that. You see the humanity and you have a connection with them, you know? Think of, like, your favorite television shows. Like, I used to love The Sopranos because, like, Tony Soprano, like, one time you're like, oh, he's such a bastard. Then you're like, oh, he's really trying, you know what I mean? <laughs> and you have these kind of different kind of things, you know? And so, like, I think it's important to try to create those kind of characters, you know, that even if you want, and that's where the love comes in, that even if you want to say something about a certain political issue, that you don't make like all the people that are that are opposite you politically like or sick. You know what I mean? There's reasons why people are like that. I've been confronted with that quite frankly in Dallas, which is interesting. I think I can say this because, you know, like Dallas, Dallas voted blue, but it's like light blue. You know what I mean? It's like a little paisley. You know what I'm saying? It's not like, it's not like, it's not like and that's just the city of Dallas. But it, it's kind of it's kind of weird the way it structures that the, you got the city of Dallas and in the middle is Highland Park and University Park, and these are like incorporated cities that are kind of, I don't know what the equivalent would be here, but like their own cities that never became part of Dallas. And that's really where the power of Dallas is. Mm. And that's where I am. I'm like in the belly of the beast, you know. Now again, you could look at LA, the images, you could look at like these, New York has the Wall Street, every place has its, you know, that kind of thing. But it's like, it's really in the hub of, of Republican culture of the country. Like really like, really like the heart of, of, of wealthy Republican. I don't mean like, you know, or, you know, Mississippi, you know, like, eh, I don't know what I mean, that kind of thing. I'm not trying to disrespect any Mississippi. You know what I mean? I'm talking about that. So it's like, so for me, it's like, it's deep because it's like, on a personal level, some people, they, they, you know, they're really nice people, but then I might have different political views than them. And I'm like, I mean, is the camera on? The camera's on now. Okay, I better leave it alone. But anyway, you know, I've, I've talked to some people that I'm like, I'm like, wow, you're, you're, you're the such and such. Of this, you know, you know, whatever. I'm like, wow, but you're like a cool dude on a personal level. We're having lemonade and chilling, but man, you're like really like, you know, the head of whatever. And I'm like, I'm like, wow, you mean an international head of such that you did, oh, you know, that kind of thing. So, you know, and so I've never, I've never, I've never censored myself. I've never had to like pull my tongue. But I've always, I grew up in San Francisco in the city, and I lived in New York City for many years. So I've always lived in very liberal places. Those places also have issues with you know, racism and sexism and stuff like that, but there's a particular kind of, like, liberal racist, you know, like, Silicon Valley sexist. It's still, I, it's still bad, but I know that. But this has been just an eye-opener for me because I've never, I've traveled, I've never lived in, like, in Texas, man. This is different, you know what I mean? But there's also a great opportunity there. It's a great opportunity there. And I would also encourage people, look, you need to be happy where you live, but... There's so many of us in L.A. and New York, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, I'm not saying don't do that. There's an opportunity, but there's also something deep, particularly if you're an artist that wants to do social justice and going to, like, you know, New Mexico or Mississippi and, like, think of the change you can do. If it works for you, it doesn't work, you know what I mean? But the change you can make in those communities is, is, is amazing if you stay there and commit, you know? Because there's artists from, that, that artists are from everywhere, but a lot of times because of the way it's structured, a lot of those artists will leave those communities. You know what I mean? And then new artists come and then they'll leave and some will stay, but a lot of times it's like there's less artists there and you got like, you know, again, New York, LA, a little bit of San Francisco, Chicago, where it's like just heck of artists, you know what I mean? So it's good, but it's also there's a whole other world out there and there's a lot of work, good work to be done. You know? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Who's got a question? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is a little long. But Break it down. Okay, thank you. Um, so in one of my classes uh, where we're talking about art, we it's a study of Dionysus. Actually, we're talking about it as a means of maintaining the polis, so mm -hmm. the space for open discussion. Mm -hmm. um, but I was at a Solange concert last night. She's incredible. And um, <laughs> she, says in, she says in a lot of her songs, she says, uh, don't touch my hair, don't sing along, and then in another song she says you have the right to be mad, and her art is more, has a little bit more of a direct message rather than maintaining the space for, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, but I, no, I didn't, I, I, I didn't, I would have liked to have a ticket, I didn't have a ticket to Salon, so I would have definitely been there, but I would argue, so I didn't, I didn't see the show, but I would argue that is about the post, that is about the city state, because those are issues, we're all in, we're, we're all in this, and I think what she's talking about, you talk about she, because she's African American, she yeah. has hair, don't touch, don't fetishize my hair, right? Yeah. So I think in some ways that's an issue for her that is bringing up with us in one global or United States community. Does that make any sense? So in some ways I think she is bringing issues, those issues to, to it. Does that make any sense? And that's what they did in the Greek thing, they brought issues to the thing and they had a, 
you know, conversation about it, you know, and they wrestle with it. I mean, that's maybe, you know, but that's, a, and that's also, actually, it is pretty, it is pretty deep thing, you know. So, again, I don't know, I haven't seen that, so I'm not sure, but I would, I would, it seems like that probably could still connect with this idea of the city-state, you know, yeah. and, the, and a citizen, as a citizen, you know what I mean? Yeah. One citizen bringing a grievance, mm -hmm. a, if, if I may, to, to other citizens, mm -hmm. you know, and this grievance is, don't freaking touch my hair. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Without asking. You know, you know what I mean? And again, it seems light, but it's really deep. Because that, that does actually get into privilege and respecting people's space. Actually, the, 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 the hair thing is real deep. You know what I mean? So it's kind of like it seems surface, but it's actually really not. Um, so I don't know if it, you know, I don't, I'm not saying everything connects. I'm not saying everything connects it to Greece. Yeah, but, yeah. but it is interesting, you know, just to see that. And I, I think that, like at CTG, I really love the fact that it's well, it's, it's warm here, it's great weather, so it's an open space. People can gather before that outside and talk and come in. I hate theaters that are kind of structured where you see the show and you go right to your parking lot, you know? Because it kind of defeats the purpose. The purpose of theater is to see a work and then discuss it. We talked about Brecht in your, in your, in your, um, in your class. And from what I understand, in Germany at that time, they had like bars and pubs lining the streets right next to the theaters. So people saw the show and they emptied into the bars and man, they was arguing and talking and, then, and that's a big part of it. You know what I mean? You need to, because we can, we can t do the Twitter and the Facebook, but you know, the theater sh the, we should excel as the live interaction. You know what I mean? If you don't have that, you might as well just do this because it's, it's good to do this. You know what I mean? So like, where's the opportunity, the space to create to, to talk after the show? I, I have a, a, qu a question, comment about both of those, talking about Solange. Um, and t what you were saying about music and working with uh, uh, rap artists or hip hop artists and, and their live performance, that you look at artists like Solange, like Beyonce, and like they're doing, they're making theater. And their videos, are, it's, it's performance art. Mm -hmm. And it's like really, really sophisticated experimental film, <laughs> right? Um, that, that, that it's in, in, interesting because when I, I'm looking at a lot of musicians right now and, and they're doing it and they're doing it really well and people, and, you know, people are always like, ugh, oh, you always hear theater is dying or theater is dead and it's like, well, it's been dying a very long death then. But right. it, it's interesting because I'm, I'm watching more and more musicians actually becoming more theatrical mm -hmm. and I'm watching visual artists investigate performance mm. and these mm. opportunities where you're not sitting in the dark but you can talk to each other mm -hmm. and so that's a question I'm always asking myself with with theater with live performance of how do you get that conversation as part of it that's really interesting I wonder if part of that we talked about this earlier is that with technology like I don't know how many people here buy music but it doesn't happen as much anymore or you stream yeah. so I wonder if that's about like I don't know but I wonder if that's about you know artists being like, I have to elevate my live show you know, mm -hmm. I don't know. I just wonder about that. You know, because again, 20 years ago, there was no, or 25 years ago, there was no way to do that. So you had to buy, you know, a very expensive mm -hmm. CD. So I wonder if it's a return to yeah. uh, a, the prominence of live performance, whether it's music or dance. Mm -hmm. You know, because that's the that's the place to really do it, right? Because people aren't really spending a lot. I don't think. Now you guys, know I don't get in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> I can say briefly, just anecdotally, I was in uh, the Netherlands about six years ago. Uh, I was working on a show there, and I went to see as much as I could while I was there. And in every theater I went to, intermissions were 25 minutes long, mm -hmm. and all of the refreshments were free. Mm -hmm. And and when it struck me, like, oh, they want us to hang out mm -hmm. and talk mm -hmm. and feel leisurely and feel taken care of, I almost fell over. <laughs> <laughs> I kept saying, I was like, how much is that? And they kept saying in there, everyone speaks English. Free, it's free, and I was like, "Am I hearing it wrong?" <laughs> and in terms, Gabby, of what you're talking about, like the polis, like they literally were invested in creating time and space to feel comfortable, to relax and talk, and not feel rushed. And you know, like the, the, the taper last night, the line to the, yeah. the bar was around the corner, and you can't do, you can't talk, and I don't know. It's just they they put their mind on it, at least. I think you know? I think that's I think that's that's really great. Like, yeah. You can get it. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. There's also state-sponsored art there yeah. in intense ways that yeah. we right. don't have. Right, right, um, right. Anyway, another question? Yes, yeah, so. Um, Kind of going with that, how do you feel we can combat this, like, theme of 
viewing art or encountering art like just to do it like there recently was this pop-up like museum of ice cream or something mm -hmm. that people would just go to to take instagram pictures with and i think the same thing is true of like certain broadway shows people mm -hmm. might go to hamilton just to see hamilton mm -hmm. like just to say that they've seen it mm -hmm. so how do you feel that like we can combat this and make sure that art is being interacted with in I think in get in a meaningful way. I think for me, it's I mean, for me personally, I don't know how you feel, but it's really about like what you combat that or you address that by you creating the art that you want to see and by you support. I know it seems like we're just like one person, but by you supporting the art you want to see. You know what I mean? I think that like, you know, there's a place for that kind of art. It's not something that I'm really into. You know, like, just kind of like, you know, oh, but, you know, but there's a place, but there's a, or maybe there's not a place for it, but people are going to do it, you know? Mm -hmm. And I'm not, I'm not really necessarily hating on those artists. Like, I'm not saying, like, you should be more political, you should be this. I'm just like, well, this is what I want to do, you know? And maybe by you doing that, it'll rub off on, on them, you know? Um, but I, I'm not saying you're saying this, but I feel like if I, if I try to, like, fight against them, it's just like, I could use that energy towards building what I'm trying to do, mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like there's often, I don't know, maybe you guys are different, but I feel like there's often, like, a respect for artists to an extent. Like, I remember when I was growing up in the 90s, in the upper room years, like, there were some gangster rappers, there was some this rapper, that rapper. And not, I didn't, like, necessarily like some of the stuff they, they said, but we were all artists, you know what I mean? And so I, I didn't respect what they said, but I respected them as artists, and they probably didn't dig the stuff we were saying. But it was a certain, our, our, our followings actually didn't like each other as much, you know what I'm saying? But we were kind of like, well, we all kind of trying to say something and do something. It was kind of a, a, a mutual respect at a distance, you know? So that's kind of what I would say, com combated by doing your thing, you know what I mean? And supporting the kind of work that you like to support. And I, just real quick, as you get older, you may be an artist, you may be a philanthropist. I mean, that stuff has power. When a philanthropist says, I'm going to put $100,000 to this theater, you know, even if you don't continue to pursue art, you, you know, that, 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 that does influence the conversation, you know what I mean? So it can be problematic, but it also can be influential if you put your money where you want it. Where you what you want to see. It's gonna say the same whole truth. The whole truth for the fifteen dollar ticket that you buy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. To a show around town. Yeah. 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 Another question. I think it was up, up there. Sean, you, yeah. you mentioned how you were perceived in Africa in terms of your race, mm -hmm. and I'm curious, um, how has your ethnicity been perceived in your lifetime, and then how have you been um, just in, in in the press? And then do you prefer, it's like a three-part question, do you prefer African-American or black? Dang, dang, that's deep, that's deep. Well, you know, it's interesting because I think that, I'm not really sure, but I kind of feel like I have the kind of look that I could be a number of different things. I, mean, I guess anyone could be that, but maybe that's been advantageous, maybe, I don't know, like, I mean, it depends. I mean, I know after 9-11, you know, I was talking to a friend of mine who's also African-American, but it's darker, and he was like, wow, Finally, we're off the hook. I go, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, man, I'm on the hook. They're thinking I'm Middle Eastern. And so, like, after that, I'm getting more looks. And they're like, well, I'm getting less for a while. Ooh, finally, you know. So it's, it's interesting. But usually, I think maybe for me, I, it, maybe it's something that, I don't know, maybe it's kind of, I've been able to kind of use it, I guess, to kind of like go in different circles. People don't put an immediate wall up necessarily, you know. Again, since 9 11, it's, that's changed a little bit, you know what I mean? But, um, yeah, I don't know. I also think that like, like skin complexion is a is a is an issue in my culture and in a lot of cultures. I think in Asia and some parts, yeah, it's a lot. It's 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 deep. It's just so silly. It's just skin. It's kind of deep. So I feel like I've also come across that as well as being African American but being of lighter skin. Whether that's you know someone like you know hating on me because I'm lighter skin, or whether it opens up a door that it wouldn't to another person. So it's kind of like both of them. So I think you have to kind of like. Use what, you know, you can't control some of that society, so you have to kind of use what you, like, if you're from Cleveland, people like that. You're like, oh, I'm from Cleveland, great. You have to try to use that to, like, open the door for other people. You know what I mean? And if it's a block, you have to kind of get around it. I've tried to use some of that, it's a deep question, to kind of be a gatekeeper, you know, as a gatekeeper to try to open a door for other, other people, you know? Um, but that's really interesting. The other question is kind of like, that opens up a big can of worms, because it's kind of like, I kind of prefer African American. I think, for me personally, I understand black, and I use it sometimes. But I kind of think the whole white black thing has been something that's that I think we've all as a society bought into. And I've been I've been kind of this is gonna sound weird. I kind of been losing faith a little bit 
but it's like <clears throat> it's like I've been losing faith in like white people, but it's not you all. It's like what that is, and not the heritage that you really are. You're really German and Swiss and English, and you know what I mean. But I think our ancestors bought into the concept of white to really make some money, and so like. I don't know if we'll ever be able to change society as the idea of like, you know, I'm a white person. Because I think that's set, set up a certain thing. But maybe the what the true ethnicity we are underneath. Does it make any sense? Ethnicities. I'm not saying going to your uh, friends of color and be like, I renounce my privilege. I'm just like you. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying, don't do all that. But I just, I, just, I just think that's really interesting, this idea of black, white. You know what I mean? Like, it's really interesting because like, what, it, what is white? I mean, it's something that's real because we made it real. But it, it, when I was working on Fetch, and I'll, I'll be quick about this. When I was working on Fetch Clay Make Man, there was a character in there um, that was an original movie mogul, William Fox, who started Fox Studios. And he does this whole monologue where he's like, you know, I, I became white. And it's really interesting as I started to research, talk to people, like there's certain ethnicities that at one time were not white and they became white. You know, like Irish were not white. Um, Italians were not white and Jewish people were not white. And then they became white. So if you become white, what is white? You know what I mean? <laughs> like at one time they weren't white and then they became white. You know, so it just, I'm not saying that that means you're not white. It just it brings up an interesting question about what that is, you know? Um, so yeah, I prefer African American. I don't know what tribes or tribes or that kind of thing, but I understand why black. And I get in the 60s why they used it because it's like, it was always like, you're black, you're bad, you're low. And they were like, no, black is beautiful. You know what I mean? Black that's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. That's right. It was a time for that, you know. So I think I think we're you know, I think names kind of come and go. I mean, what's a uh, Latinx? Latinx? You know? Yeah. So it's kind of like, yeah, kind of comes and goes. It's a deep question. That's deep, Sean. Do you play basketball? Ah, you know I do. You messing around me? I'm retired. <laughs> <laughs> My friend. Other questions? Other questions? Just kidding. What's your favorite color? What's my favorite color? I've been getting into purple. I've been into purple. I don't need purple on, but I'm getting into purple. I, oh, it's one of here. Yeah. You have like very impressive energy and like a high. It seems like a very high amount of like productivity. How do you maintain that? Oh, that's a good question. You know what? I t who was in the class with me earlier today with Sarah's class? Okay, yeah. So I, I, and I don't want to be preachy, but I kind of feel like, okay, like that the head of passes that you, that you, that you know, like Felicia Rashad's monologue. Like you want to have the physical um, and emotional capabilities to do eight shows a week. That's my thing. Again, now I'm not saying that has, that's equity. You don't have to do that. But you want to be, or like, like, I, like I was telling you before, some of these things, sometimes like you would get there and your first event was in two hours. Mm -hmm. So you have to be like, and just do it. Sometimes you have a night off, you know? So like, I would say like for me, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the joy I get to connect with you all. It's, it's feeling like I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It's not always easy, but doing what I'm supposed to do. But it's also, I really try, I'm not, the, I can be healthier, but I try to be healthy as possible. So, you know, I don't smoke, I don't do alcohol. I'm not saying you should or shouldn't, but it's just like the smoking takes away your, your lung capacity. So you'd be all right 20, but, like, I got friends that, like, you know, in their 40s and they've been smoking. And it's just, like, it's, like, it's just hard to, you know, for a little bit, you smoke for a few years, you get the little sexy gravel in your voice. It's kind of cool. You know what I mean? <laughs> but that doesn't last for, like, 40 years. So if you want to be in this for the long range, like, you know, setting up those, those habits now, you know. And then the other thing, and I'm, I'm still working out some issues, but I would say, like, anything you can work out now, work it out now. You know, so, uh, psychological, emotional trauma from the past, you know, because what you don't want to do is you don't want to become a super famous star, super famous computer guy, and then have all that trauma still sitting because a lot of times that explodes. We've seen what that's done to people. I'm not saying you have to be perfect. I'm not perfect. I still got issues I'm working out from childhood, whatever. But anything you can process to work out, the earlier you can work it out, the more it's out your system. You know what I mean? And you don't have to have that build, built up. You think that, oh, I'm, I'm only famous, I'm only rich, or whatever, but actually that makes it worse if you haven't worked that stuff out. Make any sense? You know, and I've seen that. I've seen that with some of my friends. I've seen that with some of my, you know, people that have gotten really famous and just had these issues. And, you know, it's just a harder thing to, to deal with. So try to deal with it now. Mm. You know, some, some, there's none of my business. Some drama happened when you were six years old. See a therapist or whatever your healing is, get your therapy now. Right and so play. I've tried to do that, huh? Write a play. Write, write a play. play. That's right. Write a play. Talk to somebody. Get it out there. So thank you for that.
So, um, my question is about the seven, mm -hmm. and um, I'm just curious to know what drew you to the to the Greeks. And we talked, and we talked about a little in my acting class, mm -hmm. some of um, that core um, storytelling, mm -hmm. the spirit of it. I'm just curious to hear you talk about what of all the plays you could have adapted. Yeah, why, yeah. Why go the Greeks? So here's the here's the crazy thing about about the seven. To be honest, that's the one. Well, I'm doing a couple of, like commercial things now. When someone comes, like we got an idea about you know this or that, can you do a play. Like, Let's try. But prior to this period, that was the only play actually that someone came to me with the idea, which is really interesting because usually it's like I generate the idea. So there's a, there was a small theater in San Francisco, and he was like, I got this idea of doing the seven, you know, seven against thieves in a rap thing, and I know you do that kind of thing, and I don't, I'm not a writer. So what do you think? So I actually initially did not have the initial idea. It was this, this other guy, Tony Kelly, who knew about the piece. I was like, I know about Oedipus. I don't know about the sons of Oedipus, you know? So that was the first thing. I was like, well, let me check it out. Let me see if I can find a connection to it. You don't want to do something if you don't have a connection. So that's when that other part came out. So then I started reading it, and I was really fascinated about this idea about a curse. You know what I mean? Because Oedipus was cursed. I don't, I don't, some of y'all might know the story of Oedipus. But I didn't realize his father was cursed. And then his sons was cursed. And then his son's sons were cursed, too. We don't have those plays, but there actually were plays about Oedipus' grandchildren. There were plays, and they were cursed, and they were working it out. And I think, like, uh, you know, the, uh, Oedipus' son, um, Eteocles, Eteocles' son, and Polynices' son, they came and they battled after. You know, this is kind of crazy stuff that goes on and on. So I became fascinated about this idea about a curse. A curse in the family, a curse in our culture, in our neighborhood, you know, in our community. And do we have the power to break a curse, whether it's alcoholism, whether it's racism, whether it's, you know, homophobia, whatever it is, do we have a power to break the curse or are we destined to continue the curse? And when I hear about these things like in Silicon Valley, I get very, very, um, I just get very depressed. Like this new industry and they have this intense culture of misogyny. And I'm just like, oh man, you guys are a new industry. You're not the railroad. You're not like, you know what I mean? Like why? It's just very disheartening to hear that, you know? So that's, that's what drew me to that, that idea. And that's what the Greeks wrestled with. They, that's what they wrestled with, you know, and it was really fascinating to me. And again, my thought of it is you can break a curse in the family. You can break a curse in the culture, but it's not easy. That's what I came to personally. And in that one, they didn't break it, you know what I mean? But I think you can break it, but it's not. Sometimes it's easy. I shouldn't say it. Sometimes it is easy. But it's not always easy, you know. And I know for me growing up, like, you know, not to get all long-winded, but as a father and stuff like that, I'm like, wow, I just said something that my, you know what I mean? Like, oh my God, you know what I mean? Like, it just, you always say, I'm never going to be like my mother. I'm never going to do like my uncle. I'm never going to do like those people in my neighborhood. And I'm not saying you will, but it's surprising how that is in your fabric of upbringing. So you can break it, but you have to just be really vigilant about, about that and really meet it head on. So I was fascinated by that story, you know? Um, and as soon as I read the original they all came to life. I'm like, Oedipus, I know who that is in my community. You know, the brothers, I know who that is. And just like, I just have fun. Like the Caponeus, he, he was a smack talker. I said, brother talking, talking crap in the neighborhood. I know what that is. I'm, you know, made the sea red, slapped Zeus in the head. I know what that is. You know what I mean? <laughs> I know what it is. I know what it is. So, yeah, that was a, that was a lot of fun. I, I got a lot of, uh, I, I got a lot of, uh, a lot of pushback on that piece too. It was very successful, but I got a lot of pushback. I got some pushback from people, because by that time there was a hip hop theater community, and people were like, "Why are you doing that Greek shit, man? You know what I mean? Like, what's, you know, that's, you know, why are you doing that? You know?" And I was like, "I can do. We can do any story. That's hip hop. You can do any story and flip it." And I also got some pushback from um, from some of the theater community. Like, you know, again, this is you know, 12, 13 years before uh, before Hamilton. Like, the 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 the. the the lead critic in the uh, Village Voice, Michael Feingold, who was a big deal at that time, you know, he was like, he was, his whole review was like him wrestling with his own interior, like, issues. <laughs> He's like, I, I like it, but I don't think they should be doing this. He was just wrestling, you know. He was like, this is, your know, hip-hop and, 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 and the Greeks, it's not meant well together, but maybe it does. One scene does. He was, like, was like, his own issues. And at the end, he was like, that's why the seven is brilliant and wrong-headed. <laughs> So I got it from that side too, you know. At that time, it's more commonplace now. At that time, it was like people were like, "Why are you doing hip hop in the theater?" Like, especially when I was doing my solo theaters, people were like, "You know, is it gonna be riots?" I mean, people didn't know. Like, we had to talk to them about. They didn't know what it was. Yeah. It wasn't like hip hop theater wasn't used as education. That all came out of this kind of work. So it was like, "What are you gonna do with our students? What is it?" You know, like it was like we were kind of like pioneers, like educating 
had to educate the presenters. You know what I mean? It's going to be okay. We're not going to like grab our crotches. That's this different kinds of hip hop. You know, stuff that seems stupid now, of course. Yeah. But anyway. Let's do one more. Can I one more question? Yeah, the back. Um, so I'm also from the Bay Area, and mm. I've seen a lot of like gentrification yeah. of areas. Just talking about that. Yeah, of, of areas that used to be like super rich in culture. Yeah. And especially those areas that were super rich in culture produced a lot of really beautiful, powerful art. Yeah. Are you worried about that culture leaving with all the gentrification coming in and like? That's a good question. That's a good question. I'm not worried about the culture, that culture vanishing from life, but in those regions, yeah, it might change. I mean, I think I think the Bay Area in particular will always be a creative place, but I don't know if it's going to have the the diversity, the ecology that really makes innovation. You know what I mean? Like I think it's you know because those dot com cats are in, they're innovative. You know what I mean? They, they're in their way. So I think it's going to be creative, but it's not going to be the same kind of thing where real true innovation is when you have you know, poor and working class and middle class and wealthy. I'm not saying it's all kumbaya, but there's a tension and it all exists. That's what fosters great creativity. If you have just all, all, all wealthy folks, even if you have all poor folks, it's, it's harder. I mean, they can do the stuff, but it's like, you know, even look, look at the founding of hip hop. It was people who were, you know, black and Latino from the South Bronx, poor, didn't have nothing, creating this stuff, but then people from downtown start finding out about it. The Warhols, and that synergy helped make it a global thing. You needed both, you know what I mean? If it, you know, so I think... That is gonna that is gonna change, you know. But that but it brings up other conversations about like displacement and like yeah, it's rough. It's rough in the bay, you know. It's rough in the bay, you know. And um, but I get all emotional. There was some stuff that happened in my family that was rough, like eminent domain, people losing their houses, and like you know, I'm like, man, I wish we still had the house, you know, that kind of thing. And it's it's, it's kind of rough. It's you know, again, like I said, it's like it's not just the South or the Midwest that's racist or classist. You know what I mean? Like I'm from San Francisco. That seems like the liberal, you know. But there were some real insidious things done to to poor people. You know what I mean? In San Francisco and Oakland, and they're still doing it. L.A., you know. Um, so, you know, don't be fooled with the tofu. You know what I mean? It's, 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 I mean, it's great, but it you know, just because you like tofu doesn't mean you're not misogynist or racist or something. You know, you know, it's got to be more than just the fried tofu. You know what I mean? <laughs> just because you ain't got a cowboy hat doesn't mean that. What are you doing? It's like we talk about in your, in your class. What are you doing? You know what I mean? Does it make any sense? You could be for all the great things that love tofu, but if you're displacing people, how, you know, how, why I say tofu, you know what I mean, no. <laughs> all the right things, all the right things. Yeah, for the environment, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, what are you, what are you doing, you know? And also, how are you entering a community? So if you're entering a community, like in Harlem, for example, I don't want to stereotype, but some of the, like, some of the, like, the, 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 some of the white people that moved in, they don't even say hi. They just, like, they're walking their dog, and it's just like, <laughs> you know, like, if you come into a community, even if you are paying a rent, because I've done this too, you're paying a rent that someone else can't pay. You know what I mean? How are you just being, how low can you join a volunteer? Like really be part of the community. You know what I mean? Be part of it. Don't just be like, like I think that's what this one woman told me that her friend was talking about. He's going to move in Boyle Heights and he's nervous because of the crime. He's like, well, I'm just going to get a pit bull. <laughs> like, that's not how you enter a community. Like, well, I want to live here because it's cheap and it's, you know, it's, it's trendy and it's hip and stuff like that. And I don't want to connect with any of these Latin people. I'm going to buy a pit bull. I mean, that's not the way you enter a community. You enter the opposite. You enter saying, how can I serve? How can I help? Can I join? What can I do? I know I have privilege, but I want to help. You know what I mean? And, and that's, that's the way. So if you're going to enter, enter it that way. And I don't see that happening as much in the Bay Area. You know what I mean? Like in, where I'm from, the Fillmore, it's like, it's just like, They'll, anyway, they'll look at you like you have, like, man, I've been here. They look at you like, you know, that kind of thing. It's crazy. Anyway, good question. Good question. Thank you. Maybe that's a great place to end on the idea of what can I do. Right? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all so much for being here. I know you got a lot of stuff.